All right, good to see you all um, tonight. Thank you for coming out. First, let me say thank you to uh, our great uh, staff at Recreation and Parks, the Far East Rec Center for hosting. It is a, a, a great turnout. Um, and because I am a near east sider, um, I always say that the east side is the best side. I think that I heard that somewhere. Is that what I heard somewhere before? Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> we are here uh, today to talk about the uh, 2022 capital improvements budget, uh, which has been proposed by uh, Mayor Ginther. Uh, as a quick breakdown and just a reminder that the city's spending plan related to capital projects throughout the city is contained in the capital improvements budget. And the 2022 budget is now under consideration by Columbus City Council. Capital projects relate to physical infrastructure and assets such as roads, sewers and water infrastructure, park land, fire stations, all the things that we really see and touch. We know that these capital investments are vital for supporting residents, quality of life, and our local economy. Uh, and it's for this reason uh, that we set aside 25 cents of every dollar collected from our income tax to finance these projects. And it is one of the reasons and the ways that we are able to actually do capital improvements on a yearly basis, and one of the reasons why we have that, what you hear, triple A bond rating. Uh, the city of Columbus is actually uh, one of the largest cities in America with a triple A bond rating from every single rating agency. However, the investments that we talk about and the investments that we make only do their best good when we have input from our residents, uh, which is why we hope you'll share input on the capital needs in your area of Columbus. Uh, you will have several opportunities to share with us this evening. I know there are staff walking around that have uh, comment sheets, so if you would like to speak this evening, please just flag someone down and we'll make sure uh, that we get that to you uh, and, and you'll be able to address that. Uh, also, if you are streaming with us uh, live on Facebook or YouTube, please feel free to add your comments to the chat and we will make sure that we get those addressed. Uh, and finally, we have circulated a Columbus Capital Investment input form to all of our area commissions and civic associations to garner additional input and also to hear additional pri priorities. The projects presented in the capital budget are some of the most direct ways that we invest in our neighborhoods and in our people. We want to not only provide information this evening on the budget and the investments that, we, uh, that are proposed by the administration, but also continue to receive feedback on neighborhood priorities. Uh, the Department of Finance will talk about it a little bit, uh, but we want to continue to receive those priorities for you because there's two processes. The, what we are taking up uh, on uh, next Monday is the actual budget. That is the projects that will be slated for next year. But the city also has what is called the CIP. It's a six-year plan. And so we get those, those feedback from you also that we can make sure that we put it in our projections. Similar to our homeowners, uh, the investments that you make. Uh, I look at my home, I want a pool, but I know that I have to repave my driveway first, right? And so we put that into our plan to make sure that we are also addressing the, what it is that our residents need, but also making sure that we're taking care of critical infrastructure. Uh, this input is crucial because no one is greater of an expert than you are on your neighborhood. We have a, a very large city, and it would take neighborhood experts, you on the ground, to let us know where we should be investing, and we appreciate your time and your input. Uh, before we get started, I'll, I'll take a, uh, I wanted to also make sure that I mention uh, and thank uh, Council, Council President Pro Tem Elizabeth Brown, who is the Chair uh, of Finance. She could not be here with us this evening. This is our fourth and final uh, public hearing on the capital budget, uh, but it is because of her leadership that we have gotten out into the community to make sure that we hear from folks. So I want to thank uh, President Pro Tem, uh, Chair of the Finance Committee for her leadership uh, and allowing me to serve next to her as Vice Chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, also, I want to, uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, they messed up this evening. They let the two council, the two new council members be here today and left us alone by ourselves. So we're going to shake it up a little bit. So I want to make sure that I give uh, my colleague on council, council member Lourdes Barroso de Padilla, uh, opportunity to provide some remarks before we hear from our departments. Council member. 
I mean, I'm not sure if they messed that up, Nick. I think <laughs> it might have been a great decision. Um, I just want to say um, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, for those of you who know me, I, too, am a lifelong East Sider. I claim the whole East Side um, because it is the best side and they save the best for last. So, um, but your voices and your input are uh, vital to this process because um, you know, as council members, really, we are uh, your advocates in this process, along with our departments. They are um, in a city of our size. There are lots of different priorities that are all competing with each other at the same time. And so for us to really understand what are some of the opportunities and the challenges that our different communities are facing, this is where your voice is really key in this process. So um, I, unfortunately, at some point, will have to leave this meeting because I'm, go I'm actually heading to an area commission on the Near East side um, this, uh, that has been long overdue for me to head over there. But I want to thank all of our area commissioners that are here. I know I saw Quay Barnes, I saw Jennifer Chamberlain, um, and other folks who I might have missed. It's always dangerous when you call people out because you inevitably forget someone and blame that on the head and not the heart if I don't see you out there. But thank you for your service um, and thank you for advocating for um, our beloved East Side. So with that, Councilmember Bankston. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, the way it'll work tonight, we'll have presentations uh, from all of our departments. Uh, then there will be questions from each uh, from council members uh, in between those and then we will open up for public comment. Uh, I do want to commend the administration. This is our fourth one. So if you don't hear me ask many questions, it's because all the questions that I asked in the previous ones, they add to their presentation. So I appreciate them doing that. But we will first get started with our uh, Department of Finance. And we have with us tonight the Deputy Director of the Department of Finance and Management, Mr. Chris Long. Thank you, Vice Chair Bankston, Councilmember Barossa Di Patia, and all members of council, thank you for consideration of the 2022 capital improvement budget. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming out this afternoon as well. Uh, your valuable input is certainly greatly appreciated. Um, I want to thank uh, Mayor Ginther for his leadership and support and guidance in putting this budget together. Auditor Kilgore for her uh, guidance and leadership as well. And Director Kathy Owens, uh, who's the finance director as well. Um, so as Vice Chair Bankston mentioned, I, I work in the finance department and uh, my goal in just a short presentation here is just to give um, all of you just a quick snapshot overview of what the CIB process is, what it looks like, and then to drill down a little bit and just give you um, a snapshot of what the finance portion of the overall city capital budget is. Um, so um, we'll go ahead and uh, get, get moving with that. Are there some boards behind us here that give some graphics and numerics behind the capital budget. Um, certainly happy to answer any questions on those either after my presentation tonight or just after the meeting in general. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, so I don't know if it's cycled through yet, but there we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, so just as a quick background, in the city we have two uh, uh, budget cycles. One is our operating budget, one is our capital budget. I know we're not here to talk operating budget tonight, but I like to just throw that out as, as a way to kind of get some perspective. So our operating budget is, it pays for the daily operations of the city. Think people and programs, right? It's for our personnel, it's for supplies, it's services that, that fund the ongoing operations of the city. Um, what we're obviously here to talk about tonight is the, the capital improvement budget. Um, that funds, as, uh, as Vice Chair Bankston mentioned, uh, infrastructure improvements. Those are our roadways, uh, our recreation centers, um, you know, infrastructure in the city. Uh, as uh, Vice Chair Bankston mentioned, uh, we fund that with a 25% set aside, we, meaning every income tax dollar that comes in, 25% of that is set aside into a special income tax fund. Um, it may sound pretty boring, and it kind of is at times, but what, one thing it does do, as, as Vice Chair Bankston mentioned, is it, it locks down those dollars to specifically pay for and debt service our capital improvement budget dollars. And that helps us to maintain that AAA rated uh, bond rating that Vice Chair Bankston mentioned, which helps us keep our costs low and, and hopefully pass those along to um, the community. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, and one more slide, please, sorry. 
So uh, what does finance do, do in all this? Well, largely we compile uh, the capital budget on behalf of the mayor, uh, and we present that information to council and to the community. Uh, so we partner with departments, many of whom you'll hear from tonight, and we, we co you know, coalesce and pull together all of those different capital budgets into one uh, giant uh, request, if you will, for capital dollars. Uh, as, as mentioned, I work in that department. Two of the individuals that I just wanted to mention who are not here tonight, uh, Kyle Severhart and Angela Cousin, they head up our debt management team. They largely put this capital budget uh, together for us, and so I wanted to thank them for all the work that, that they put into this. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> So our capital budget request for 2022 is $1.24 billion. That's citywide, it's across all departments. And I thought it was worth mentioning that it, it actually has two different components to it. There's a carryover component and there's a new dollar component. And I, I know it, it sounds a little in the weeds, but I, I thought it's worth mentioning. Carryover dollars, as you would imagine, many of these capital projects are multi-year investments, right? So if you're building a rec center, it's over several years. If you're and, and doing new pools, if you're doing roadway improvements, it's over multiple years. So it's very common for the city to pass a capital budget and not spend every dollar from that capital budget in the fiscal year that it was, it was adopted. So carryover is just that. It's monies that were adopted in a prior budget that just haven't all been spent down yet. And we require city council approval to re-adopt those dollars. So you'll see that in, uh, on the slide there, uh, of the $1.24 billion, 379 of that is carryover. It's monies that were already adopted last year that are carrying over to this year. $859 million, though, is new. Those are new dollars. They're new investments in the community, um, and I think largely the focus of, of tonight's discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Of the new funding, so $859 million of new funding is being proposed. Uh, 100, excuse me, $307 million of that is special income tax supported, meaning it's directly supported by the taxpayer dollars of the community. And uh, the, the other part, which is 545 million, is supported by ratepayers. So they would be the subject of our Department of Public Utilities. Deputy Director John Lee is here to, tonight to talk about those investments that happen within our utility infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. So as mentioned earlier, finance has its own capital budget within the larger capital budget. And, and we are uh, an inward facing department. So you don't probably interact with us quite as much as you would say recreation parks or public service or public safety. We, we are really in the business of helping other departments do their work. And so our capital investments are largely around investing in city owned facilities, not recreation centers, they're city owned, but not really community-based centers, right? So much of our budget is about that, investing in existing infrastructure. So I'll just run through these very very quickly, just to give you a flavor for what, what is in there. So the first two line items are about um, facility renovations that we, that we in finance need to do. We have about 100 buildings under our purview. Things like City Hall would be a good example of that, or um, our, our municipal campus, or some public safety facilities, whether they be substation, police substations or fire stations, we need to invest in those, right, and keep them in good working orders. So you'll see facility improvements in there as a capital line item. Uh, we have uh, our OCM, which is design, project management, and small scale renovations. We have our own construction management team that works in, in finance, and they help design and administer capital projects. As such, some of their uh, personnel is capital eligible, so we have to we have to include that in our capital budget. So you'll see a small uh, line item for that. Um, municipal campus renovations is just that. It would be needed infrastructure improvements to our municipal campus. So it would be things like City Hall, uh, our purchasing uh, and public safety shared facility, uh, the Coleman uh, Government Center, uh, those types of uh, downtown-based buildings. We need to keep those in good working order. Uh, we have our Sustainable Columbus Projects line item uh, for $2 million. Sustainable projects mean investing in energy efficiency uh, technology in our city buildings. So to the extent solar is applicable, we want to look at that. Uh, retrofitting HVAC systems, LED lighting systems. We want to ensure that we're investing in sustainable uh, technologies, not only because right, it's the right thing to do, but it helps lower energy costs, which um, is a good thing for the community. Uh, 240 Parsons Avenue for $9 million. This would be an investment in our, our Columbus Public Health Department. It's, it's a 100-year-old building. 
Um, and as such, it requires, uh, you know, routine and sometimes significant capital improvements. Uh, this $9 million request is to uh, undergo third and fourth floor renovations at that facility and also for an entire roof replacement. The, the roof is, is, is past its useful life and we would like opportunity to invest in that. Uh, municipal court CMAR. CMAR stands for construction manager at risk and we, we are in contemplating investing in a new municipal court building. Uh, we will need a construction manager to assist in that process, to help with design, to help with uh, construction uh, bidding, uh, and just general advisory uh, services. So that line item is, is for that purpose of $2 million. Roof replacement program is pretty self-explanatory. Many different roofs at the city. We want to keep those in good working order, so we're seeking dollars for that, $3 million. And then finally, the last two line items, community facility renovations. We, we sometimes have the opportunity to partner with community agencies. Example would be Adam H. Um, to invest in shared use facilities that will benefit the community. Uh, this isn't for a specific idea necessarily, but we wanted the option to, to be able to move quickly and, and flex in a flexible manner if an opportunity arises. So there's a million dollar request for that. And then finally, North Market renovations. The city owns the North Market. That facility, again, like every other facility, needs routine uh, capital investment. Uh, there, there is a line item for $2 million for that, uh, $25.6 million in total. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a very, very quick overview of the capital budget timeline. This is how we build it and, 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 and seek approval. So we created the budget. That's what we're here to talk about. Uh, public hearings are what we're doing right now. Uh, council adoption is what we're, we're certainly hoping for. Uh, and then we move actually into selling municipal bonds for, for those dollars and then eventually putting shovels in the ground. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, this is just some information about how you can reach the finance department. My contact information is on there. Director Owens is as well. And there's a, a little web link if you want de very detailed line item by line item information about this capital budget. It's all on the finance webpage. Uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards, call me anytime, happy to get you more information, and uh, Vice Chair Bankston, happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, uh, Deputy Director. Any questions? All right. Uh, I do want to pause and recognize State Representative Latina Humphrey of the 26th House District. We are in her district, so thank you for hosting us. Uh, next we have up uh, Deputy Director Hannah Jones of the Department of Development. Thank you, Councilmember Bankston. Sorry, got to orient myself. Apologize. All right. In 2019, Columbus voters approved a $50 million affordable. Oh, dang it. All right. I'm going to start over. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. My apologies. Councilmember Bankston, Councilmember Barroso de Padilla. I am just killing it tonight. I apologize. <laughs> Let's talk about Department of Development's budget. I apologize. The Development Department uses capital funding to make investments in support of our neighborhoods by increasing access to affordable housing, promoting community development, and generating jobs that pay a living wage. Our 2022 capital but improvement budget reflects these commitments, and we are requesting $78 million. This includes $22 million for affordable housing, $22 million for community development initiatives, $21 million for economic development projects, $7 million for planning and the urban infrastructure recovery program, and $5 million for human service capital projects. Affordable housing is our highest priority. Our goal is to foster a housing market where every household can obtain housing, which costs no more than 30% of their monthly income in the neighborhood of their choice. In 2019, Columbus voters approved a $50 million affordable housing bond package that leveraged more than $300 million in public and private investment to build more than 1,300 new residential units. Funds from the 2019 bond package have been fully allocated, and our capital request includes the final $19.5 million needed for these projects. Neighborhood planning is vital to the continued growth of our neighborhoods. The Columbus Planning Division works closely with residents on land use planning and design guidelines in an effort to improve the quality of our neighborhoods. Our capital budget request includes $22 million for the acquisition of key real estate sites to ensure growth that supports those neighborhood plans. In addition, our planning division coordinates the Urban Infrastructure Recovery Fund, and because we like to use lots of words, we like lots of acronyms, so we call it UIRF. 
UIRF is a neighborhood-driven program that works in partnership with the Departments of Public Service, Utilities, and Recreation and Parks to provide improvements to roadways, parks, and street lighting. We plan to invest up to $30 million on 175 projects in the current round. Our capital proposal includes $7 million to continue work on these projects. Our request also includes $5 million for human service initiatives, including $3.5 million to support Adam H. in the development of their Addiction and Crisis Center, $1.5 million for Alvis House in the development of their South Side facility, and $350,000 for repairs to our homeless shelters. Lastly, I'd like to talk about our public-private partnership program, or our 3P <coughs> program as we call it. Through 3P, the city makes targeted infrastructure investments that leverage private investment to support the city's economic development efforts. These projects are designed to create new employment centers, revitalize neighborhoods, and spur job creation. The partnership approach of the city has been critical to our continued growth. Over the past five years, we leveraged 28.7 dollars in investment per one dollar of capital city investment. Our, two, our 2022 capital proposal includes $21 million for projects including $17.5 million for projects within the Arena District and the Confluence Village area, $2.5 million for infrastructure proje projects within our neighborhood commercial revitalization districts, and $1 million for development within East Franklinton. This concludes our 2022 capital budget proposal, and I would be happy to answer any questions better than I can make a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Deputy Director. Uh, and, just to, and just to point out, uh, we passed this resolution already, but uh, again, we will go back to the voters uh, for affordable housing, which is critical. Uh, that $50 million was the first time we did it historic for our city. And going back to the voters again for $200 million, I think, um, is more uh, than overdue and, and needed. And you can hear the results from just the 50 million, how many units we got there. So uh, look forward to that on your November ballot. Uh, next week. I, have, I do have a question. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, um, uh, thank you, Deputy Director Jones. I have a quick point of clarification. When you talked about the UIRFC, -I -I it's Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. um, uh, you said there was 30 million for 135 projects and 7 million for ongoing. So is it 37 million in total of, of the 30 million? Oh. Seven million is for ongoing projects. Okay. You're you're on your A game today, and I am on my C game. We plan to invest up to thirty minutes. Our proposal proof. Uh, so I would say that it is seven million within that thirty, not thirty-seven. Okay, so not yes, thirty. So thirty million in total. Yes, ma'am. One hundred thirty-five projects of. That seven million is for ongoing projects that are already part of that one thirty-five. Yes, ma'am. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. All right. Next, we have uh, Department of Recreation uh, and Parks, uh, and we have Deputy Director Steve Highland. Thank you. Good evening, members of Council. Thank you for the opportunity to present our two thousand twenty-two capital budget. I also, again, would like to thank everyone that came out here today. We, as Chris said, we take all your input to help us work through the, these budget processes. Uh, our first slide is, can you go to the next slide, please? It's our mission step up, back up one, two, one more. There we go. Thank you. So our first slide is our mission. just want to read our mission to you. It's to connect the people of our community through the power of nature, wellness, and creativity. Uh, next slide, please. This is a good slide for you to take note of. It's, it just shows all the various parks, facilities that are part of our park system. Uh, we are fortunate to be able to carry out this mission through our support of the annual capital budget, which is a direct, event, a direct investment in our 407 parks and all the amenities and facilities they offer. Next slide, please. From the 2022 capital budget, Recreation and Parks proposes $66,535,000 in new capital support. That represents $23,285,000 in base funding and an additional $43,200,000 to support additional mayoral investment and large-scale projects. An additional $63,330,000 will be carried forward from 2021 capital budget, much of which is already encumbered from the prior year. All this capital funding, a total of $129,865,000, goes towards supporting these existing assets as well as investing in the growth of our recreation and park system. Next slide, please. This slide represents how we distribute 
the bond funds that go out into our park system. In 2019, Recreation and Parks began to use this allocation model to help guide our capital planning process. This helps to ensure that each year we are taking care of the assets or existing parks, as well as expanding our park system to serve more people and keep pace with the growth of the community. The following slides will help outline some of our active and proposed capital improvement projects that will fall within each of these allocation categories. Next slide, please. I'm gonna go through each, each slide. There's, there's more projects in the area and out in the city than this, but I wanted to, we'll keep it short on the slides. Take note, there are boards over to the side that list some of our ongoing projects and projects in the future. We're also gonna have some boards in the back for bikeway improvements, but how funds are distributed, uh, it's a sampling of renovation projects to start with. Forestry and park maintenance equipment we purchase with capital, bridge and culvert improvements, hard surfaces, sports courts, walking paths, parking lot and drive resurfacing, various parks, Far East Drive park resurfacing, um, street trees planted, hazard removals of stump grindings, HVAC improvements, roof and building improvements at Beatty Community Center, masonry, masonry improvements also, and then energy efficiency upgrades and lighting at Barnett and Far East lighting and cameras. One of our main priorities to take care of what we have as a result, we commit 51% of our budget for improving our existing parks and facilities. Next slide, please. Uh, also with playground improvements at Portman Park, Williams Creek, Three Creeks, Spangler Road, Sycamore Fields Playground, Nelson Park Playground Replacement. Um, we also do park amenities and replacements with this funding for park signage, picnic tables, benches, grills, bollard replacements, trash cans, and fence replacements. Next slide, please. General Center and Park Renovations, Helsel Park Improvements, the design, Big Walnut Park Waterline Design. Next slide. A sampling of development projects are Greenway and Shared Use Path Development, Big Walnut Trail, Win Winchester Pike to Nasker Park and Nasker Park to Main Street, Eastmore, New park development would include Gender, Gender Road Park design, No Bixby North Park, and Mason Run North Park. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide is parkland acquisition. Uh, Recreation of Parks prioritizes parkland acquisition based on two factors. That's access and acreage. This is captured by the metrics 10 minute walk, each, which means we're striving for every resident to have a park within a, or a trail within a 10 minute walk of their home. And then level of service, which means that there are adequate acres of parkland for every thousand residents. Also note these, most of these acquisitions leverage outside grant dollars from the state and other entities. And to note also, since 2019, we have acquired over 250 acres of, of parkland for either conservation or future park development. Next slide, please. Large and small projects is a category. It supports capital improvements for the fee-based programs, rental services, which is shelter house rentals, golf, and sports. These pay for themselves and also help sustain the other programs in recreation and parks. These three programs operate 12 indoor and 20 outdoor reservable event venues, five athletic complexes, and numerous sports fields and six golf courses. Next slide, please. This was the additional funding that we list as large scale investment beyond the base allocation, just to go through a few of them that are in process. Uh, Glenwood and Windsor Pool construction, that's gonna start this September and should be complete summer of 2023. Tuttle and Marion Franklin, that, uh, these are, the design is part of this package. These will be the last of the pools that, to be renovated, then we'll have all our pools in, in good condition. Then we'll st start looking through our, our plans to potentially do spray ground improvements based on what we find in our aquatics master plan. Uh, West Case Parks Phase 1, Bicentennial Fountain, Climate Action Plan, Broad Street Arts Facility. It's to incorporate programs that once were held at Martin Janus and Golden Hobby Shop along with new programming. Then an Urban Forestry Master Plan and Bridge, imp bridge Improvements. Next slide, please. Again, my uh, contact information is on this last slide. If you want to take, take note of my email, please feel free to send me any questions by email. Also, I'll be glad to answer any questions after the meeting today. And again, we have a bikeway representative and more boards up there if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Director Hyland. Uh, 
next we have up the Department of Utilities, and with us we have uh, the Assistant Director, uh, John Lee. Good evening, Council and members of the community. Thank you for the opportunity to present an overview of Public Utilities 2022 capital budget. Our budget includes $666 million in total funding across all community planning areas. In the east area, we have a total of $30 million planned in the capital budget. To give you a little background on the department, we serve over 1.2 million customers in the greater Columbus area. We provide water, sewer, storm, and power services. We operate three water plants and two wastewater plants in the city and serve about 15,000 power customers. Each year, we produce over 50 billion gallons of finished water and treat nearly 70 billion gallons of wastewater. As mentioned early, earlier, uh, the majority of our capital dollars come from bond funds and loan funds from the Ohio EPA. Our funding stream is separate from the general fund. The repayment of the stream, the repayment stream of our projects comes from monthly and quarterly utility bills paid by residents and businesses. Deciding where to install new projects is driven largely by master planning, some emergency situations, 311, new development, and just general uh, aging infrastructure that needs upgraded in neighborhoods. Some of a few, a few projects in, the, in these planning areas uh, in the east side, in the mid-east, we have three areas that will receive upgraded storm water infrastructure to mitigate flooding and drainage issues along Petzinger and Barnett Road. Barnett Road will, will be designing 7,640 linear feet of new storm sewer to mitigate road, yard, and ditch flooding. And on Petzinger Road, we will construct a new storm sewer from Petzinger Road from Glenbrook, Glenbrook Drive east to Courtright Road. This project will alleviate localized street and yard flooding. We will also be conducting a storm sewer assessment project in the James Livingston Blueprint area. The city is installing green infrastructure in this area and assessing the condition of over 10,000 linear feet of sewer with construction planned in 2023. Our volunteer sump pump program, phase one, continues in this area, which is associated with Blueprint Columbus. Installation of sump pumps are expected to begin in 2023. Finally, in the Mideast area, we have eight water line projects that will be in construction later this year and into 2023. Streets and areas that will see updated infrastructure include Southampton Road, South Wyant Avenue, Aragon Avenue, Roswell Drive, Roosevelt Avenue, Wellington Boulevard, Elizabeth Avenue, and Barnett Road. The total construction cost of these water lines is estimated to be $24 million. In the Near East area, we have a water line project along Greenway Avenue that's planned for construction later this year. This is a $3.4 million project. The purpose is to improve water flow and water quality and replace water mains that require repeated maintenance. In the Far East area, we are continuing our design work on our Plum Ridge storm sewer improvements. This project will install new storm sewers, manholes, and inlets to alleviate yard and street flooding. Some of the roads impacted include Plum Road, Balsam Drive, <coughs> Norfolk, Portsmouth, and King's Charter. Finally, along No Bixby Road and Refugee Road, we have streetlight projects that are closing design and will have construction in 2023. We will install about 45 new lights on each one of those roads and associated wiring and new controllers. Members of council, members of the community, Thank you for the opportunity to provide an overview of Public Utilities 2022 capital budget, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Assistant Director. Uh, I think we have a question from Council Member. Um, thank you. Assistant Director, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked before because now we are on the east side, which um, I know you talked about Project Blueprint and the phase one of sub pumps, but can you just share with folks if they have not heard of the sub pump program, how they can, um, if you could put in a little plug, for how they might be able to um, access that sure. resource. Sure, absolutely. The sump pump program is just one of four pillars of our overall Blueprint Columbus program. Uh, the idea is that we want to capture as much rainwater and get it out of, a, of the storm, the storm sewers, and into the storm sewers and out of the sanitary line because 
all that rain goes down to our plants and we overflow and it goes into the river creating water quality issues. So the sump pump portion of it is, is important if you don't have a sump pump in your home, many homes don't, um, the idea is that we would dig a, a pit in your basement and install a sump pump because a lot of the water comes off your roof and it gets down and it percolates down along your block wall and then it goes actually into the, uh, the sanitary sewer because older homes, the foundation drain um, is tied into the sanitary line. And so what we want to do is capture that rainwater and then pump it out to the road. So I have some, um, some cards here that kind of go over the sump pump program, the eligibility requirements. It's a free program. Um, and so you can easily sign up when we're in your area. And the blueprint program in general, you can go into our website. That's probably the best resource to see exactly what year uh, we're going to be in your area. And again, Please come up and, and review all of the um, different aspects of the Blueprint program if you can, just to get some education uh, if you don't already know about it. Thank you. I, I know <laughs> as a kid who grew up in a house that consistently had a basement that flooded, you know that this is something dear, dear to my heart. So these um, uh, projects that are going to help, especially along that um, area, the James Road, Barnett, et cetera, um, and along other parts of the east side that are on that floodplain. I really appreciate it. So thank you for answering that question. All right. Thank you, uh, Assistant Director. Uh, next, uh, we have the Department of Public Service, and we have with us Assistant Director Steve Wenzel. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Bankston, Councilmember Barroso de Padilla. Um, first off, and the members of the community, of course, Thank you for this opportunity to speak briefly about the Department of Public Services proposed 2022 capital improvements budget and to detail some of the projects we have on the east side in our communities. The Department of Public Service proposes <clears throat> proposed 2022 capital improvements budget totals $208.2 million this year. That's made up of $123.6 million in new funding and $84.6 million in carryover funding that will invest in roadways, sidewalks, bikeways, bridges, and other projects that will improve the quality of life in our neighborhoods. As in previous years, the centerpiece of public services proposed capital budget is $31.2 million in new funding for the city's resurfacing program. The Department of Public Service maintains approximately 5,700 lanes of city roadways. Of these lane miles, Approximately 96% of this network consists of asphalt surfaces with concrete and brick, making up the other 4% at 3% concrete and 1% brick. The resurfacing program mills the existing pavement and replaces it with new asphalt, performs partial and full depth pavement repairs. We upgrade the ADA ramps um, along the resurfacing corridors. We put in new curb, we do curb repairs and pavement markings and new loop detectors that uh, trigger our, our traffic signals. This year, there will be three major resurfacing projects totaling $28.5 million. With these projects, the department plans to resurface over 230 streets and repair or install new 988 curb ramps across the city. The department also plans to spend another $1.5 million resurfacing or rehabbing some of our concrete and brick streets throughout the city. Some of the streets, or a sample of the streets, this is not all inclusive, that will be resurfaced on the east side are Justin Road from Country Club to Manfeld Drive, Rio Grande Avenue from Three Rivers Drive to Big Walnut Drive, Fair Avenue from Eastmore Boulevard to Brookside Drive, Browning Avenue from Livingston to Eastminster Road. Of that $31.2 million in resurfacing, $1.2 million will go to urban paving projects, which are joint projects between the department and the Ohio Department of Transportation, or ODOT. Also included within this proposed capital improvements budget are other high-level investments that are being made specific to the east side areas of our community. For example, Cassidy Avenue widening project, which will widen Cassidy Avenue from Beckley Corporation limits to 7th Avenue. We've allocated $3.5 million in this budget cycle, and we're also going to leverage $5.6 million in federal funds to complete this project. 
The Cassie Avenue widening project consists of full reconstruction of the roadway to a three lane curb and gutter section with additional turn lanes at the intersection of East Fifth Avenue. Sidewalk will, will be placed along the east side and a shared use path along the west side. Additional improvements include traffic signal replacement, street lighting, street trees where feasible, and storm sewer. We also have an intersection improvement project at Broad and James Road. One million dollar has been allocated in this 2022 budget and we're going to leverage another three million dollars in ODOT safety funds. This project will construct dual southbound turn lanes, provide protected only southbound left turn phasing, and realign northbound and southbound left turn lanes to provide additional site distance properties. We will also construct exclusive right turn lanes on the northbound and southbound approaches, reconstruct existing traffic signal with back plates, and modify signal timing. Included in this year's capital budget is new funding in the amount of approximately $3.4 million for our bridge rehab program. Typically during a budget year, we will enter into a $1 million to a $1.5 million annual citywide bridge rehab contract. We are required by the state of Ohio on an annual basis to perform bridge inspections. Every year we check each bridge. We're roughly checking 426 bridges across the city, and we assign a rating based upon a visual inspection. Maintenance needs, if any, are determined yearly after work plans are generated for each structure requiring maintenance citywide. This project performs maintenance to various structures, prolonging the life of the structure and minimizing maintenance costs. The type of work typically performed on bridges includes patching of concrete surfaces, micro resurfacing, painting, replacement of expansion joints and crack sealing. This 2022 capital budget proposes Proposal includes $6.7 million in mobility safety improvements. Although not in this year's capital but improvements budget, we do have a few mobility projects that are being designed currently with construction being funded in the 2023 capital improvements plan. First, we have allocated $3.1 million in, in the CIP or capital improvements plan for the bikeway development Tussing Road SUP project or shared use path project, which will run from Bryce Road to Hines Road. This project will add shared use path along the south side of Tusting Road from Bryce Road to Hines Road. Enhanced pedestrian crossings will be provided at Americana Parkway at the west intersection and at the Tusting Road Elementary School. Sidewalk will be added on the north side of Tusting Road between John Stephen Way and Penobscot Scott Boulevard to facilitate access to the enhanced pedestrian crossings. Second, we have allocated $785,000 in the CIP for the 2023, for 2023 construction for the pedestrian safety improvement project Barnett Road sidewalks from Astor Avenue to Main Street. This project will provide sidewalks along the east side of Barnett Road between Astor Avenue and Main Street to complete a sidewalk connection on Barnett between Livingston and Main. Previous projects have extended the sidewalk to Astor from Livingston, that was the Livingston and Barnett intersection improvement project. This project completes the remaining portion going from Livingston all the way to Maine. Lastly, the 2022 capital improvements budget includes $9 million for resurfacing collection vehicles to replace and update the division's fleet that service over 344,000 households every week. Some of this equipment will be dedicated to support the Clean Neighborhoods Initiative to address the persistent problem of illegal dumping in our neighborhoods. Again, I would like to thank council and the community for this opportunity to present the 2022 capital improvements budget for the Department of Public Service. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Assistant Director. Just one question that I always like to make sure we reiterate. Could you just talk about our philosophy on uh, how we do resurfacing? We have a lot of streets uh, in the city. Uh, so just talk a little bit about how we prioritize those. Uh, and then second to that, how, what is the best way for residents uh, to request a street paving or bring it to our attention? Uh, yeah, thank you, Council Member Bankston. Um, we do include an, a, a number of factors when we look at prioritizing resurfacing streets. Um, one of the main things we look at, but not exclusively, we look at is what we call the patient the pavement condition number. So we work with our street maintenance crews as well as an outside consultant to evaluate every three or four years 
all the city streets citywide. We look at all the materials, all the residentials, all the collector streets, and we uh, assign this PCN value or pavement condition number value to it. Um, a lot of times we'll do some core sampling, things of that nature, to see how this, the street is structurally um, holding up and things like that. Um, so that we, we use that as a baseline. So we're looking at the, the lowest level of streets first. So the ones at the 30s and the 40 level streets all the way up you know, to the 80s are the higher numbers of the better streets. Um, we also looked at um, how much traffic that street gets daily. So if it's an arterial or a collector, it might get some more traffic. We might put a little bit higher priority on that than a, a, a side street that might get you know 10 to 20 cars a day. So we kind of look at the traffic situation. We also look at input from our street maintenance people. These are the guys that are out in the streets every day, uh, what we call boots in the, in the streets, and they're seeing the conditions of the roadway, so we get a lot of input from them. We also, you know, they're out there filling the potholes. They're seeing the conditions of the road, so we do get a lot of input in that from them. And also, council members, as you were saying, we get a lot of input from the, the, the public. So we use 311 a lot, um, either if we're looking at uh, requests for resurfacing or if requests for pothole fixes or anything like that. So if we know there's a street that has a lot of potholes, we get a lot of calls on that street, we might send a street investigator out there to look at that street again more closely um, to see what's going on and see if we need to get that moved up in the resurfacing schedule. So those are like some of the things that we look at. We kind of look at other like when was the last resurfaced. We try to get um, you know 20 to 25 years on average per street um, that we resurface before we have to resurface it again. Now some of our uh, arterials and our, our main collectors are more often you know, done 10 and 15, 10 to 12 years, and that some of our residentials are a long period of time. But we kind of take that into evaluation too. All right. Thank you. Uh, and one more, y'all, and then. <laughs> We're going to get to you, I promise, okay? Just hang with me, just one more. Uh, last uh, up is our Department of Public Safety, uh, and with us tonight, uh, a former member of finance who actually used to help run this process. So uh, <laughs> Deputy Director Dan Giangardella, sorry, I always messed it up. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Banks and um, uh, Council Member Barossa de Padilla. So, and also thank you to the community for allowing us to come out tonight and talk to you about the capital budget. For public safety, um, the capital process is a little bit smaller for us, where in the operating side, we are about $600 million. On the capital side, uh, we're just about $36 million. And it's mostly based on uh, buildings, fire stations, substations, as we'll see. Uh, we do have $10 million in the capital budget for a real-time crime, the design of a real-time crime and a 911 call center. Um, our 911 call center right now is uh, on Fairwood Avenue. It's been there over, a little over 30 years. We have outgrown it in terms of personnel and technology, and uh, we really need to, for the future, uh, look at a, a new place, and we'd like to um, get the synergy of a real-time crime center with that since uh, a lot of that information is common for, for both and it's also the call center is the first port of contact uh, obviously for uh, for police and fire calls to our community we also have uh, in this case uh, the hilltop area we do have funds for the design of a new uh, precinct or a new uh, substation that is precinct 19 uh, we are in the process of acquiring land for that, and then uh, we will look to design that, uh, hopefully start that process late this year. We also uh, have land and are actually already in the process uh, for design of a fire station, what we're calling Fire Station 36 in the far northeast. Uh, I think council last month actually approved the design funds for that process to start. We also have $6 million for fire apparatus. And uh, you know, fire apparatus can uh, be replaced and placed in any of our 35 fire stations. And for 2022, uh, we're looking at five engines and five EMS transport vehicles, along with the associated equipment for those. We also have a million dollars for the neighborhood safety camera program. I think we're entering year 11 uh, of that process. Um, Initially, we were in five neighborhoods in the community with about uh, 110 cameras over the past decade. We have increased that to about 260 cameras and obviously increased the number of um, 
uh, neighborhoods we are in. In fact, for the, uh, the east side, east side is actually, I think, one of our high areas for the number of cameras. I think the Livingston Avenue corridor, we have something like 50 uh, neighborhood cameras uh, in, this, in this vicinity. And obviously, we're looking to uh, some additional cameras throughout uh, the core of our neighborhoods. We also have uh, $2, two million dollars for police and fire, 800 megahertz radios. All of our police officers, all of our fire vehicles are equipped with mobile radios. Uh, these are obviously part of the lifeblood of communications and public safety. Those obviously have to be replaced over time, so this will allow us to purchase uh, about 400 of those units. On the uh, south end of town, uh, the police impound lot is um, just south of Route 104 by Hall Road. Uh, that uh, facility, which was um, constructed about 10 years ago, has a gravel lot that parks about uh, several thousand vehicles. Uh, it is in need of uh, some attention. It needs to be resurfaced, so we have $6 million to uh, resurface the parking facility at the police impound lot. We also have $3 million for what we call general renovations for our police and fire, um, fire stations. Our police substations, we have about 20 of those, and then we have approximately 35 fire stations. They require a lot of attention. They get um, a lot of use. Uh, this money would do things like uh, generator replacement, window replacement, some minor kitchen renovations, uh, some roof uh, replacements, general safety upgrades, uh, HVAC uh, upgrades, et cetera. And then lastly, we have about a million and a half dollars in funds for um, our additional vid video server storage space. You may be aware that uh, the police body camera system is being upgraded. I think this is year five uh, from the initial investment. And uh, as I said, we are in the midst of upgrading that. We store a lot of uh, video from that system and also the neighborhood safety cameras. We have a lot of video from that, and we want to make ensure we have enough storage space for that video, so there's a million and a half dollars uh, to buy server equipment if then that need should arise. That's all I have for the public safety capital budget, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Director. Any questions? No, we should get to Council Member. Slips. All right, the most important part. Um, so I'm. First up, we have Austin, Mr. Austin Hill with the refuge. Uh, come on up, and just as a reminder, oh, sorry, the microphone is in the back there. Uh, just as a reminder, there will be a three minute limit on remarks so that everyone has their time to speak. And uh, the east side is an active bunch. We have 15 <laughs> speakers, so I'm excited. Mr. Hill. Um, I'm glad y'all can hear me. So, Councilmember Bankston, Barroso Day Padilla. And other department heads, thank you so much for being here tonight. That was not three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I am a director at the Refuge. It's a men's addiction recovery program based on the west side. And I am here on the east side, to not stand too close to this, to talk about how addiction does not care which side of town you're on. To date, there's already been, in Franklin County alone, over 100 and, 170 overdose deaths. Um, I personally know seven of those. Uh, based on just this type of recovery. And what I'm here to talk about and advocate for is that an investment from the city in addiction recovery will actual, actually improve every single one of your budgets. Because addiction does not care, again, what side of town you're on. It also does not care um, where you live and where that money comes from. All addiction cares about is it wants to take people out of this world. What, we have a solution here in Columbus called The Refuge. We are one of many, but I do, I'm selfish here. I think we are one of the best ones. Uh, the Refuge has been here for over 22 years. Uh, we have been serving uh, anybody that comes in. Some of the stats from, the re from us by ourselves of these men who have uh, completed our program, it's a 13 month program. We are one of the only ones in the state that require that provide a long-term addiction recovery program that is completely free of charge. Of the addicts and alcoholics who came to the refuge upon completing our residential program, 66% reported being continuously clean and sober and free from the compulsion to drink or use drugs. 92% reported working continuously in full-time jobs, producing a living wage. 86% 
reported living in safe and affordable housing. 94% reported food security. 87% reported having reliable forms of transportation. 90% <coughs> reported not having used emergency rooms or hospitals for drug or alcohol re related reasons. 96% reported having no involvement in the criminal justice system. Still further, what is most inspiring to me and most important personally to them, 90% of the men who've completed the refuge reported being more trusted and relied upon by their children and people who mattered most to them. Those stats is the sound of a cycle being broken, but it's not just a cycle being broken on one side of a town, it is a, it is a cycle being broken in all sides of this city. And so I'm advocating for an investment from the city into addiction recovery resources like the refuge. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Healan. Thank you for all the work that you're doing on uh, the west side of Columbus, but like you said, more broadly in our city. Uh, next, we have Mr. Ali Rogers. Oh, sorry, Miss Ali Rogers, I apologize. And just so that folks are prepared on deck, we have Mr. George Holloman and Mr. Melvin Perdue. Good evening, everyone. My name, like you said, is Ollie Rogers, and I live at 3359 Sycamore No Drive. And I'm speaking on behalf of Sycamore No Drive and Glen Oak Neighbors. We live off of Sunbury Road, which is a dead end street, and the traffic over there is terrible. I've been there for many years, but since Easton has been there, and also 270, that traffic is really terrible. Sometimes we have to sit there 15 minutes or more just to get on to Sunbury Road. And heaven forbid if an emergency came up and we had to get out of that street and if the emergency squad would have to come in, I don't know how, how they would do it because the cars are bumper to bumper and they don't leave any space in the intersection for you to come out. And uh, there is a light at Easton Way, and there's a light down at McCutcheon. But in between there, there isn't anything, so that's where our problem comes. And by it being 45 miles an hour on that road, it's just terrible. And the people that come up there, they never go 45 miles. It's either 50, 60, 70 sometimes. And then they pass on the double line all the time. And if you are going to speed limit, they think you're going too slow. So they'll pass on the double line. Hmm. And I was coming home the other day and I was coming down from Easton and this man, I don't know what he was doing, but if I hadn't, have, hadn't had to stop, he would have came head on to me, but luckily it was nobody behind me. So I did stop, and when he was aware of what was going on, he got his head up and he jerked his car. So we're asking for a traffic light there. At, I mean, it can be any place or something to do something to the lighting so we can get out. Because, I mean, we are taxpayers, and I don't think it's fair to us to have to go through this. Because I know up at, e at Morse Road, there is a traffic light at Morse and Sunbury, and a couple feet up, there's businesses that they just put a new light in. And I know their business, but we are taxpayers, and we are just asking that something can be done about that. I have called 311 and put my complaint in, but nothing has happened as of yet. So we would appreciate if something could get done about that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rogers. And uh, I live right there in McCutcheon Crossing. Uh, so I, you are very right about the speed on Sunbury Road. Um, we'll get, make sure that we get your information uh, to Deputy uh, Director. Uh, I know in these cases we can do a traffic study and, and, and look at the pattern and see if we can get a, a traffic light as warranted there. So thank you for your testimony. Next we have Mr. George Holloman. Going once, going twice. All right. Then we have Mr. Melvin Perdue.
on deck, we have Miss Lori Green Holt. Green Lot? Okay. Green Blot. Green Blot, got it. All right, Mr. Purdue, welcome, and you have three minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm a, a member of the Sunbury Hill Gang, and uh, I live at 3241 Glen Oak Drive, uh, Columbus, Ohio, right off of Sunbury Road. We are on a dead-end uh, cul-de-sac. There are 25 homes there that have been there probably for 60 years. I've been in that neighborhood for 50 years. And all of my constituents that are here with me are longtime residents there. My direction is the Public Utilities Commissioner, the Public Safety Commissioner, and the, the uh, one more, uh, the Public uh, Service Commissioner. Uh, we need uh, some assistance there on the speed, the safety, and the quality of our neighborhood raised to the level of some of the neighborhoods in Hilliard. We would like to have some new sewage. Uh, we have to walk in marshy land when it rains. And we've had power failures there which have knocked our sump pumps offline for two, three days. So I'm not a fan of pump, sump pumps. <laughs> but if there's anything that we can do about the commercial vehicles on Sunbury Road, a tractor trailer loaded coming through that transition from Morse Road to McCutcheon, those trucks are averaging 80,000 pounds. They're 10 feet, nine inches wide. The highway surface there from center line to curb is nine feet and 11 inches. So if you have a turn with a 60-foot trailer on the back of an 11-foot tractor, when you make the turn on McCutcheon going towards Steltzer Road, you'll be in trouble. That way, 28 can't get into our area if there is an accident at McCutcheon or Easton. One way in, one way out. So my addressing today is to public utilities to the public safety, and to the public service. Come and look at our neighborhood, and uh, we haven't had a resurface on Sycamore Knoll or, or Glen Oak Drive in 40 years. I thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, um, Purdue. Mm -hmm. um, did, when did any of the uh, deputy directors or assistant directors want to address that and what their best course of action could be? Um, well, for as far as public service, um, we can definitely come out and we can look at the roadways and look at the conditions that you were talking about for, it was Sunbury and Linol Drive? Knoll, Knoll Drive, Noak Drive. <clears throat> and look at some of the speeding that's going on also. Um, we can actually kind of look at how traffic is flowing through that neighborhood and what changes that could be. Well, come through as fast as they are and stuff. And then um, we can also evaluate the, the heavy truck traffic that's come down Sunbury. And I'm not sure exactly what process, but there may be things we can do. So, yeah, we will definitely take a look and have some of our people come out, traffic division. So. I think Sunbury Road, sir, if I'm not mistaken, is a trailer. Uh, all the research that I've come up with, it doesn't mention that. But in the 1800s, it went out to Sunbury. County, mm -hmm. which was a uh, county seat at that time. And it's designated a trail, a national trail, that there should be a way to go. There's a bridge at Allen Creek at Mock Road that has no markings for load limit nor safety. And when you go across that thing at 30 miles an hour in a dump truck, which I experienced last week, foundation of that bridge moves so there's no load limit on Sunday road at that point thank, thank you mr. Uh, Purdue uh, we have miss Lori Greenblot Greenblot sorry I got All right. it I'm my name is Lori Greenblot I'm here with my neighbors um, first I got to say Nick you have a great 
FM radio voice. Excellent. <laughs> it's, it's my backup job. There you go. Well, it should be. It should be. Anyway, I'm here because we um, live, uh, I live on Brookwood Road in Berwick, and we live on um, what we call what, uh, Twin Lakes. But what it's known as is Spring Lakes, also Bliss Run. Now, the Bliss Run watershed actually starts at 17th by the airport, and it comes down underground through Eastmore, and then it comes and through Eastmore, Eastmore South, and it comes back up at um, Livingston Avenue between Kenwick and Brookwood. And it's a brook through there, and then it forms what we would call Twin Lakes, but for ease of discussion, Bliss Run. And it was incorporated in, it started off in 1870s, it was, it's a spring, a freshwater spring. And Amo Andros, Ambos, my fault, you can watch this on PBS, you can Google him. He used to bring the underprivileged kids out there and uh, it was a big park and it was really, really nice. And then it, then it got developed. He donated to the city, but that's a whole other story. But it did get developed. It was a golf course at one time. And then Berwick was bought up, subdivision, et cetera. And um, it is, we were told it's private, private property because we do own in the middle of the lake. However, the city of Columbus has maintained it for as long as I, as long as I can remember. I'm an East Sider. I'm a proud graduate of Eastmore High School. Woo -woo. Went, yes, went to Fairmore, then we moved to Berwick. <laughs> I went, and I went to Berwick School, Johnson Park Junior High, and Eastmore. So I know, I grew up on these lakes, and there used to be a flow like nobody's business. Everyone, we used to, we always ice skated on them in the wintertime, and kids still ice skate them on them. And let me tell you, we could have seven inches, because my neighbor would go down and make sure, okay, you can go out, you can go out. We'd have seven inches of ice, and the water would pour over the dam. Now we have a trickle over the dam. Something happened in 2019, because where it comes up at Livingston Avenue, and that was Brookwood Church used to be there, there's now National Church Residences building, that, building a senior facility there. Anyway, something happened in 20. 2019, where there was no more flow, and good, John, I'm glad you're looking. <laughs> there was no more flow there, and we have these islands in the middle of the lake. And I'm not here because not only are they unsightly, I'm here because it's a health hazard. It is mosquito larvae infested, green, blue algae, stagnant water. It's disgusting. And you can go, come and take a look. You're more than welcome to come to my yard, but you can easily see them from College Avenue. There's a weir in the middle of the road, and the city has maintained them. And I've called, this has gone to deaf ears since August 7th of 20. Now granted, August 7th of 20, I don't have to tell you, it was hard to get a, a hold of anyone. But since then, it's deaf ears in the, in the city. I don't, do my neighbors have anything else to add here? Because it's, it is septic. Thank, thank you, uh, Ms. Thank Green. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we'll make sure that I think utilities or recreation and parks will, can uh, look into that for you. On another note, um, I don't know, what's your name? I gotta remember. Steve, I've gone through, th I've gone, I've gotten two flat tires in the last two months here in the city. 270, <laughs> one and one getting off of 70, going up, off, getting up to 315, going to Rich Street. FYI. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to mention that at the end of the meeting, usually folks hang out a little bit after. So if there are very specific questions that you have or concerns that you know are directed at one of the departments, that you can also address it there, just so that that way we do have like 15 slips. So I want to just ensure that we get to everyone. <laughs> This. All right. Next, um, we have uh, Mr. Willis Brown, my president. I was a former resident of Bronzeville Civic Association, so <laughs> Mr. President, welcome. And I don't have to tell you the rules. I know you don't. Yes. Okay, I'll take 
Yes, good evening to everyone here on the far east side, east side, and council members up there. And I see we have a new one. I, we haven't met yet, but I'm glad to see you there. We have Hannah and others that, that I know of. So it's good seeing everyone. Uh, I'm here as president of the Bronzeville Neighborhood Association, where the boundaries are from Broad Street to the north, to, to the south, I-670 to the north, uh, Jefferson Avenue to the west, and Taylor Avenue to the east, about one square mile. We have over a hundred million dollars going in the ground with residential development. We have high end, middle end, and, and workforce development housing in our small area. Um, we've been working with the developers and the city to make this happen. What we're also asking for is funds to be put aside that we are coming with developers and hopefully with the city to put money for a parking garage on Long Street next to the Equitas building. When they have functions uh, at the park, there's parking issues. Um, now that we have this residential boom, uh, people are concerned about parking. Uh, we have res retail coming on Long Street. We need a place for them to park. We don't want to be like the short north. We want to be better than the short north because we can plan ahead. The city owns the property right across from the Lincoln Theater. And we sent a, pro a, pro a proposal that I've worked with, and uh, my vice president, uh, Dana Mason, we worked with a couple of developers to draw a schematic of what can come there. And we would like for the city to sit down with us and let's get this built. Don't build it after like the short north. Let's build with the development. We have two big buildings coming in now. Uh, the Deal, which is named after Richard Deal. We have the Ogden, which is another residential building coming in across from the Adelphi. So we have all this coming. Uh, so we'd like to some help in that. We have been asking since uh, 2008 for pedestrian lighting. And, and I tell you, it's sad that I haven't even have to mention this. We have, the city gave money for development. We want to continue that, but you must give lighting to the indigenous people who put money in the coffers for the developers. And you look at the development on Mon Mon Monroe that we both supported. You see it, it's like a stadium at night. And you look north, it's like a, living in the cave in the 18 or uh, 1600s or something. It's just dark. And we've been asking for pedestrian lighting, and we're hoping that you can put money to put that in the ground. Um, Mount Vernon has a traffic calming uh, process that we all supported. It stopped the accidents at Champion and Mount Vernon. They have a temporary stuff up, but those things are falling down, and no one is repairing. I mean, they, they need to be repaired. So public safety, they get in the middle of the road, um, so they need to be re-adhered to, adhered to the uh, ground. They need that. We also want permanent uh, monies for permanent traffic devices to slow the, uh, the calm the traffic on Mount Vernon. Um, and there's two other things. One, the other one is that of um, we ask for traffic devices for slowing in the neighborhood as well. They have some temporary things you can put to slow down the traffic within the community. And we were asking that. And um, I didn't see with the uh, with the pools at Maryland Pool. We mentioned that, but. The Maryland pools and other pools have wonderful roofs. I don't see why the city can't put money in for solar panels. To, to, we had asked that for um, Maryland pool because it works for three months and have enough power to run the generator and the rest of the months it could be putting it on the grid and it didn't happen. And the final one is for recreation and parks. We have a park at Hamilton and Spring called the Bronzeville Community Park. We had to write a dissertation to get this park in our name. We, we are happy for that. It's a beautiful park, but I've been asking for electric and a flagpole. And, I've, and, and, and as of today, we don't have it. And we have a jazz series every Sunday afternoon, and we have to borrow or pay for electric from a neighbor's house on the city. But I said, that should not happen. So I would like to talk with you. Our, our next event is Sunday at four to six in the Bronzeville Community Park. But I would like to talk to someone that we can get that in for next year. So that's it for me. And thank you for having this. And we hope you can put money, uh, as you say, put money where your mouth is. So we hope that you can do that. Thank you. Uh, 
And, Ms. and Mr. Brown, actually, I'm leaving here, as I said, to go to the AC Near East um, Area Commission meeting. And we've been working with um, the chair there on a lot of the things that you talked about in that area, along with public service. So that is at the top of our list for things to work on. So thank you. <laughs> Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Willis. You know, I, I miss being on Hamilton Avenue um, and seeing all the great development there. So thank you for your years of advocacy. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Dana Mosier. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Mosier, I know you know the rules as well, so. Yes, awesome. Dana Masoner, Vice President of the Bronzeville Neighborhood Association. And I'll just add additional information to some of the things that Willis Brown was saying, President Willis Brown. In talking of the parking garage, we have development all around. And with the Near East Area Commission, and with residents that participate in the Near East Area Commission discussions, every development project of any size comes down to parking, parking, parking. Where are they going to park? And since 2008, we in the Bronzeville Neighborhood Association have been promoting the parking garage from across from the Lincoln Theater. And the reason why this is so significant is the Ohio Theater, the Palace Theater, uh, you name all the various, the Southern Theater, you go down the list, what do they have? They have parking garages next to, adjacent, or underneath. So the Lincoln Theater has multiple events happening simultaneously. We've had, we had our big event March 3rd for the Bronzeville uh, commendations from the state and there was another event downstairs at the same time, a youth group. So multiple things happening. So we really need that parking garage there, which will help encourage other development, particularly with commercial retail, on that corridor. The other thing is we are so excited with the state-city partnership on the uh, 71 corridor through Bronzeville. We were the first part of that new development of the freeway with the feeder roads, the uh, Pier Elijah Pierce and Lester that flank the freeway. It's almost completed. And it will be opening between Broad Street and Long Street before the end of the year, going north and then going south on the west side. Now, one of the things that we've talked to both with the State Highway Department and the city from the very beginning of this project when we were on the Near East Area Commission was that we really wanted to <coughs> reinforce the city's desire to reconnect the Near East Side with downtown. One of, the new, one of the other ways you can do this is make Long Street over the bridge two ways. It now ends right at the freeway on the east side. We all know that with the COVID and the way the office, uh, biz offices are now working downtown, you do not have the same traffic patterns, particularly on Long Street. Most of the day, Long Street does not have the traffic volume. So we could have actually two ways on Long Street all the way down to Cleveland Avenue, then put one way coming out of downtown. And doing that, you will further reconnect all the development surrounding the Lincoln Theater to the other side, which has the Normandy and all the other residential projects. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Moser. Uh, next we have Ms. Uh, Felicia Saunders. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Saunders. Welcome and you have three minutes. Yeah. Good evening, and thank you, uh, City Council members, for this opportunity to speak tonight. Um, my name is Felisa Saunders, and I am a member of the Mid-East Area Commission, the MAC, as the treasurer, and I'm also the president of the East Haven Civic Association. I have been the president for 10 years, and I lived in the East Haven community for 33 years. I'm also on the board of directors for the Unity House, which is also in East Haven, which is on Balfour Square and it's a sober living house for men dealing with substance abuse. Um, I come here tonight with several concerns. Um, many years I've asked for sidewalks on Petsinger Road from Courtright Road to Petsinger going to Wadsworth. Um, it doesn't have to be on both sides of the road because there's a lot of residential homes over there and it's also areas for 
um, some businesses, but at least on one side of the road, because we have children that are dropped off there for um, school, for busing, and it's, very, it's not safe. Um, it's not proper lighting over there for that. So that's one of the things we would like to see. Also, sidewalks down um, Refugee Road. Many years we were told that um, sidewalks were coming on Refugee Road, but they're not there. And recently there was um, this con conversation about tiny homes coming on Refugee Road um, right there by Court Right, and um, that would be a concern with not having proper lighting, having sidewalks there, um, you know, um, as far as for people to be able to have transportation there for tiny homes, a lot of people don't have cars and transportation, so they would rely on the CODA system. So to have lighting and, and um, sidewalks there would be a benefit. Also, we would also like to have a camera there at Court Wright and Refugee Road. We only have one in East Haven, and it's right there at uh, Petsinger and Court Wright Road. So that would be a, a a plus because there's a lot of activity right there on that corner. Um, also, we would also like to have, um, and I've always been an advocate for this, a rec center in East Haven. Not necessarily East Haven, but somewhere on the southeast side of Columbus because there's a lot of development coming with um, homes coming, um, apartments being, you know, coming, and we just need a place for our youth, our elderly, um, our families to have a, place, a safe place to go to. Um, I've been told, and I've been asking this for 10 years, 10 years I've been asked for a rec center. And I've been told that it takes, you know, time to plan, we have to do bonds, you know, we, we, it takes um, $10 million to build a brand new one, but there's infrastructure around that we can use to build a place where people can come and enjoy a rec center, you know, something like this. Um, also, East Haven Elementary School was just vandalized. Somebody shot into the school. Uh, and they broke into the school and tore the school up. The principal and the, and the teachers there worked hard to get a new library with books. They went in there and just vandalized it. Got up on the roof, they tore up the, they just got air conditioning unit last year. They got up on there and stole the copper piping. I mean, the school is old. My kids went to that school, you know. Um, and we need a new school, but in, in the meantime, until that happens, we need proper lighting out there because they're out there um, having sex in the parking lot, they're doing drugs, and just all crazy kind of stuff in the evenings. Um, so lighting would be the first thing I would request that we could do for that. Um, another thing I would like to have is, there's been many times we've done a traffic study right there on James Road coming off of Route 33. It's, the speed limit is 50 miles an hour, but everybody, there's people doing 60. There's at least an accident once a month right there at Court Wright in, in Ravenswood where they tear out the, 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 the guardrails, the, the stop sign gets torn out. You know, if you're sitting right there at that stop sign, you take a risk of getting killed. Um, also, the GPS is routing trucks into our neighborhood. I live off of East Haven Drive and trucks, semi-trucks, dump trucks, all type of trucks come down. We just got the speed humps and we thought that would help the situation. Doesn't work. Get rid of the speed bumps. They don't work. <laughs> they slow down. We, we get a lot of runs through our neighborhood because we have senior citizen Elimus states there. So we have a lot of people in the senior citizen homes where they have to come in and do runs for emergency visits. And then with our opiate epidemics, we got a lot of people ODing. You know, we have a house in our neighborhood that has an issue with that. The speed bumps, I mean, they're great. You think they work, but they don't. <laughs> yeah. um, and then one other thing I would like to talk about is um, just the ability to deal with our crime in our city. You know, I'm an advocate for our youth and making sure our youth get the resources that they need. But I think sometimes we need to realize we need to go where the criminals are at and make a, and, and let and reach t tap into them. I used to post up at our corner stores um, for several hours and provide resources, okay. um, entertainment. Um, just talking to the gang members and the drug dealers, just trying to find ways I can help them get out of the situation that they're in. We can, we can, take, we can create a, an event for people to come to, but the bad people are not coming to those places. We need right. places, we need okay. to go where they're at yep. and let them know there's resources. And by the time I get off that corner, I get yep. loves and hugs and drug dealers and gang members try, saying thank you. I didn't know. I had no way out of this situation. But the fact that you came and told me there's opportunities for me to get out of this situation they made a difference okay. in their life. Thank you, Ms. Saunders. Yeah, and we'll definitely, we could chat afterwards, um, uh, but thank you for your testimony and all the capital things that you mentioned, we'll make sure that we uh, take a look into. All right, thank all right. you. Thank you.
Uh, next up, we have uh, Mr. Alpha Tonger, uh, uh, president of our Liberian community. Uh, Mr. President, welcome. And uh, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you, Council Member Banksin. Um, Council Member Podari, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thanks to my community members for coming here today. My name is Alpha Tonger, and I am the President and Executive Director for the Liberian community here in the city of Columbus. Uh, I'm a local business owner here in the city as well, and a community organizer. Uh, I've been working with the Liberian community for over 10 years in multiple capacity. It's a fast-growing New American community, predominantly on the far east side of town. Uh, in 2019, we saw the need to purchase, to develop a community center. Uh, the community got together and purchased a one-acre land on Hamilton Road and Kimberly Parkway and did the blueprint so that we can develop a community center at the facility. As you all know, uh, the, that area is asset desert. There is no resources uh, for community members. Crime rates are high. Last year, we lost a community member to gun violence and also suicide. So there's a huge need, especially for the new American community. In that area, there's a growing new American community from Senegal, Mauritania, and other parts of West Africa. And it's very, very difficult for them to integrate to the community. So we as a librarian community, we took the leadership in terms of stepping in and seeing how we can fill the gap. Right now, we will really, really be interested in develop, developing some form of public and private partnership with the city of Columbus. We already have investments in it. We are raising capital, and we need some form of assistance and support from the city of Columbus. So as you guys design the capital budget, we hope that you look forward to that side of town, that we will be putting the community center in there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, President Tunger, and uh, was there for the flag raising ceremony and, and happy to see progress being made. And also congratulations, 175 years of uh, Liberian independence. So we're looking forward to celebrating that this year as well. Uh, next we have uh, Ms. Quay Barnes, uh, chair of the MAC, the Mid-East Area Commission. We are in her uh, side of town tonight. So Madam Chair, welcome. Thank you very much, and thanks for all of you coming. I kind of was hoping that I would be behind Jennifer Chamberlain from the chair of the Far East Area Commission because my question piggybacks her. <laughs> so is it possible for her to step in my stead and then I come behind her? Um, sure. There she is, right there. <laughs> My question is really simple. So every year um, we have, and, and thank you, Councilman Banks and, and directors, every year we have the directors out, um, whether it's at Barnett or Far East, uh, for this same event. And every year we ask, um, what is the percentage in the capital budget for the east side? We, we would like to see, every year we ask for it, a chart or something that can be displayed that shows what is the percentage of the capital budget that goes to our east side. All right. Uh, pretty simple. I'm, I'm sure we can calculate that for you. We do have it broken out, and that's why we uh, do these by region and by side of town, but I'm pretty sure we can get that to you pretty easily. And Deputy Director Chris Long is shaking his head, yes, so. Yes. Happy to help on Now, Ms. Quay Barnes. Now, Ms. Quay Barnes. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Jennifer. You are sitting in the midst of what is called the Greater East Side Coalition. We walk in lockstep. Uh, Far East Commission, Greater Southeast Commission, and the Mideast Commission, and we welcome tonight our, uh, our neighbors from the north. As you can see, again, we support all of the things that you want to do. Uh, we are always here, we are here in great numbers. If you'd had this at seven o'clock, I guarantee you we could have doubled this amount of people here. 
Um, so what I'd like to say then is that my, our question is, we've, oh, by the way, we have all, each commission has submitted to you a list from their commission separately. And then we also submitted a separate joint coalition uh, statement for East Lamar, the East Lamar area. So the question that I have, and it follows Jennifer's, is that it appears that more, that greater funds go to areas of the city with partner anchors such as Children's Hospital or Easton. Really hurt us hard when we saw that $2.1 million going to Easton. And we're like, uh, hey, we're here. <laughs> uh, we don't have those anchors. And if we don't get tax abatements or some sort of a break for, uh, for companies to come here, we never will. And therefore, we're never gonna be uh, in appearance to the city as a place for us to have development. And therefore, we will never ever thrive. So I think I just wanna put that in your minds. And I have myself on timer, so I'll be quiet. And I get emotional about this, because I love my side of town, and I love the people in it. Uh, we have worked hard, and we've done as much as we can do on our own. We need you to step up. Please look at the list that we submitted. They're not difficult things to do. And please, please take into serious consideration about the redevelopment of the Eastern area. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Barnes, uh, for, for your leadership and, and continued advocacy through the years. Uh, and I know uh, that in his state of the city to address the mayor, you know, declared that this was a priority area for him and looking forward to going through that process. Uh, next, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Kathy Smyers. Did I say that correctly? All right. Listen, I'm, I'm bad with my own handwriting, y'all, let alone somebody else. Hey, I just wanted to go next. I'm sorry, because I am one of the other commissioners for the Greater Southeast Area Commission. Wait, wait, now, wait a minute. Do you now, mind wait, if I go next? Wait, wait a minute now. Miss, I'm going to have Miss Myers go. I know y'all got, got a press going on. Miss Myers, are you okay with her? All right, go ahead. All right. All right. Got the full press. Go ahead. Is the, is the mic still? Okay. I'm sorry. I wanted to go next because um, Quay, Jennifer, and I, we are in the same... Um, group um, with the east side uh, commissions and again i just want to reiterate what they both said i also want to uh, specifically ask for uh, you guys not to forget that we are part of columbus too we're on the southeast side of columbus i'm looking for more people to join our commission uh, we go from 33 over to uh, Refugee, out to Bowen Road, and over to Hamilton Road. It's a very large area. There is a, a lot of uh, farmland in our area, but there's a lot of residents. It is fast growing, and we have a lot of um, housing and um, development going, and, and we're looking for um, some people to join our commission, but we also need a rec center. Our kids cannot go all the way over here to a rec center. It is a long ways for our kids to travel. Um, we don't have very much for them to do. A lot of the um, um, shootings that has been happening and the, and the things that have been happening have been happening um, in my commission. And I really think that we have to give our teenagers and our young kids something to do. They can't go too many places to do any kind of indoor sports. When they close the pools in all of the suburban areas, our kids have nowhere to go to go swimming. There are no water parks for them to go get um, cool off in the water for anywhere. So I, I really want Columbus to stop forgetting us when they make decisions about what's gonna go on in Columbus because our kids don't go to Columbus schools. There are very few. There are some who do, who do go to Columbus schools, but most of our kids attend the suburban schools because we're right on the edge of um, Franklin County. So um, one, I'm looking for more people to join our commission. So for all of you that are online or that are watching this um, in the city of Columbus, and if you're in that commission area, please know that we have open seats. And second of all, I'm looking for the city of Columbus City Council to please look at getting us a rec center because our kids need some place to go to um, have recreation and our families need some, a community center. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Barnes, uh, Chair Greater. Uh, Southeast Area Commission. Uh, 
Ms. Myers. Hello. My name is Kathy Smyers, and I live on the off of McNaughton Road. And so, how many McNaughton Road residents are here? Okay, so I'm going to try to speak because I wasn't planning on it. Um, let's go with the concerns. I want to know how the City of Columbus is going to address the infrastructure changes that are necessary for the um, future um, apartment complexes that a um, builder is going to submit. Um, to the City of Columbus. I think it's been in the works for a couple years now prior to COVID. Um, I would like to know how they are going to address um, issues with the noise order ordinance, um, the sound of the 270 freeway. Um, the neighborhood that I live in backs up to the 270 freeway. They stopped at a area that's near um, there's like an open area, and we're hearing that backlash. We can't even set out on our patios because all you hear is freeway noise. The second thing that I want to address is um, stormwater and infrastructure issues. Um, I know that the current um, attorney for this developer did our development in my neighborhood. We do have issues with the water. We hired an engineer back in um, 2000, I think it was 2003, to look at um, what was going on and what was causing the water. Um, when the independent engineer looked at it, th they told us that they did not follow the plans that they submitted to the City of Columbus. And so the problems were basically on the homeowner to address. We are having issues, I know, in the area that they're going to be building it. There's, they're saying there's ponding water and mosquitoes. And I know from working at Ohio Environmental Protection Agency that ponding water breeds mosquitoes. So did I capture everything? We know that the apartments are going to occur. We're concerned with the roadway, that a two-lane roadway cannot support it. We have a EMS and fire emergencies that come off that roadway. and. It's just, how are we going to protect the residents? I heard you say that it's about quality of life, and a lot of these people are senior citizens, um, uh, homeowners, office workers, what am I missing? Children, the ch and they also want to address the child that was killed on McNaughton Road, okay? Did I cover it, every? Awesome. That's my question. Thank you. Th Thank you, uh, Ms. Myers, and I know with large developments like that, there's typically a traffic study done, so we can look into that uh, specific development to make sure that, that that's happening. Uh, in regards to the sound wall, I'm glad that my colleague at the State House is here, because that's an ODOT issue, and I see her taking notes, so she's uh, on it for you, uh, State Representative Latina Humphreys. Uh, next we have Mr. Scott, and I'm not, I can't understand the, let me see. Bert, something, Bert? Merle Bert, thank you. <laughs> Hurl Bert, got it. It's, it's not an easy one. <laughs> oh, listen, I, I was telling you, I, I can't read my handwriting half the time, so there you go. <laughs> I can relate, thank you. Uh, yeah, I am Scott Hurl Bert from uh, Leewood Gardens Neighborhood Association, which is right next door here. Uh, we're about almost 800 homes. Uh, and part of the Mid-East Area Commission, which I have my shirt on. And <laughs> Mid-East Area Commission is part of the Greater East Side Coalition, working with two other commissions, Far East Side and Greater Southeast Side. And council members, thank you for coming out here and everybody else from the city. We appreciate this opportunity to interact with you and to voice our concerns. And just thank you for coming out to the Greater East Side. You're always welcome out this way. Um, I do want to say that um, we, we out here we've been kind of this big blob like we don't have any definition but that's changing but a lot of it, it we hear a lot about Linden and Hilltop and we're very happy for them but I'll tell you the Mid-East Area Commission as Quay mentioned too nobody works harder than we do and we, we just want good things for our people. We want safety. Uh, for example, 
about 200 feet from where we're sitting is where Mackenzie Ridley was shot and killed right here in this park. So that, that brings it home. That's what, that's what we're talking about. And the first thing I do want to talk about is the importance of the parks and what a great job they're doing with limited resources. And I talk to a lot of park personnel, and that's all I hear. They have limited resources. They can only do so much with what they have. So we'd like to see more funding for them, more personnel to keep our parks safe, beautiful, and a place that's welcome and people feel comfortable going. Uh, like two examples, down here in the Arboretum, the trail, it's a beautiful Arboretum. If anybody gets a chance to go down there, take a walk through the trail. But there are two places in that trail that are constantly muddy and impassable. And they've been turned in 311 several times. They're still not fixed. It wouldn't cost that much money to fix that. That shouldn't, that shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that much work to get something that simple fixed. There's also two semi-trailers out there that have been used for storage for several years that no longer have been used for several years. They got jagged metal, they're rusted, they got rotted wood inside. I think a vagrant is going in and out of one of them. They got rodents living underneath of them and they're just sitting there. Nobody's using them. Take them out of there. Clean them up, get them out of there. You, you, it, it, the cost to take them out, you can get it in scrap metal from the trailers. They're sitting right in the middle of our beautiful park. Why? That's been turned in 311 several times. Uh, one thing about this roadway, we've fought for years to get that repaved. It's in the books now, but I'll give you a little quick history. Several years ago, we fought and fought and fought. They had potholes as big as that basketball backboard right there. We fought for years to get that fixed. Okay, they're gonna fix it. What'd they do? Tar and chip. We said, no, that's not gonna last. And it didn't. Now it's on the books to get done. We, we promised it was gonna be this year. Now they're saying it might be next year. I say, let's, let's get it done this year. We, we deserve that. And it's for safety, it's for beautification. If that's not worth it, what is? I'd also like to say something about Columbus City Schools. I don't know how much of this has been talked about, but uh, Wal Walnut Ridge High School is an embarrassment. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Holbert, yeah. I, I, I'm not on school board, so I can't do anything about this, uh, the school. I apologize. But I don't understand why that is, but I know. It's, sep it's a separate entity. Yeah, but we, we, I think we got captured all your concerns. I know I saw Recreation and Parks uh, Deputy Director taking notes and We'll make sure we check into that for you, as well as our public service deputy director on the street repaving. Oh, right, thank okay. you. Okay. And all, all, I wanted to, all I want to say is that this morning there were 15 youth that came out of this building in a, in a group, and they went through the neighborhood and the park picking up litter. And it was a beautiful sight to see. I'm not sure who coordinated, but... We need more of that kind of thing, interaction with the community and youth and everything we can do to bring good news and success stories to the greater east side. Mm -hmm. That's what we're asking for. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, our next speaker is, I just have Tracy, no last name. Right. Miss Tracy. And just a reminder, Mr. JP is there with the, the timer. That beautiful chime you hear is not someone's uh, nap alarm going off, I promise. <laughs> Hi, my name's Tracy Murphy, and I'm part of Leewood Gardens. Thank you, Scott. Um, thank you guys for being here. Never been a part of this, and I'm glad I'm here today to share my voice and concerns uh, with, with my community. I've been living in this community now for almost 14 years. And when I got here, it was a mess. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, what did I do? I bought my home. And, uh, but you guys were involved and I didn't know anything about it. I met Scott and you guys started cleaning up our area. So I wanna thank you because you have been out here and there, there has been work done. But since I've been here in the last eight years anyway, I've noticed that you guys were out here and you paid the 
south side, I live at 1662 South Hamilton Road. I'm right on the service road. I'm the only house between Keeler and Dundee. The city of Columbus always forgets my trash. I'm always calling 311. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why they can't follow the maps to pick me up. Uh, the blue can or the green can, it happens quite frequently. Just happened, they just picked me up yesterday, actually, with the blue can. That's one issue. It's like, what is going on that people cannot follow detail? Um, there's a house at 4425 Dundee, 4405 Dundee that's been vacant for years. We have the grass is this tall. There's so many rodents and pests. Since I've lived in my home and I have a beautiful home and I take really good care of it, I've never seen pests. There's moles taking over my yard. There's, there's about 20 skunks running all through, trying to jump my fence. I'm buying all this stuff to try to keep these rodents out, filling up holes. And times have been tough financially, so I can't just go pay someone to come. So I'm trying to do it myself, and they're everywhere. I've called 311. They, giving me resources. I've just called all the numbers I can call and I still have no help. And I feel like the city of Columbus should be able to help with that, with this pest control. It is just crazy. I mean, they're out in the daytime. It's that bad around my home um, and everyone else's on that block uh, from Dundee to Keeler. But that 4405, you guys need to get rid of it. You said you were two years ago, four years ago, it's still there, that you guys were gonna take over it and do something about it, and still no one has. So I'm really concerned about that. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an eyesore. It shouldn't, you know, it's an eyesore. And it's a creating a lot of pests and rodents that we've never had. Also, um, our bridge. I'm right in front of the bridge at 1662 South Hamilton Road. I work for CCS, too. Uh, I'm an employee. But the kids that walk over that bridge, they have walked over to see nooses hanging from the bridge. I heard you guys talking about cameras. Uh, they come in video on that bridge where I can't even sit on my porch because there's drive-by shootings because they're video live and people who are, they're gang banging with are seeing them so they're shooting them, shooting at them while they're videoing these videos. I, I'm the only house right there in the back. The bridge is here and I'm here, and they're all out in front with their big lights and cameras on the bridge, on the ground, and it's a safety issue. I take care of my mother. I just moved her in my home. Uh, she's not the only senior in our area. It's a lot of seniors, working people, retirees, uh, homeowners in my area. Um, I'm really concerned about that. That's a really big safety issue when you can't even sit on your front porch and the lights are dim. You can't see at night. There's a bunch of street lights, but they're not lit up. It doesn't make sense. Why are they there if they don't work? You know, they used to work when I first got there, but they don't work anymore. I guess they haven't changed the bulbs lately. I don't know. Caught about that as well. So I heard you talking about cameras, part of the safety. Once you get one at that bridge, because there's a lot going on at that bridge. What's the address? Where, where's that? I'm at 1662 South Hamilton Road on the service road right across from Lee Wood. I'm on the east side of the street. Lee Wood is on the west side of the street, the school. The bridge comes from the school to my house. So the kids are also walking across that bridge. There's many kids in my area. It's really been scary these last three years at my home. And I, I don't have, that's my home, and I should feel safe, you know? I should be able to feel safe in my home. And I know we need a lot of resources and a lot of things have changed since COVID, but we've got so much money. Let's get busy, let's do what we gotta do to fix things that we need to bring safety and help our youth, you know, just these resources. My area has not been paid since I've been there. The, the ground is it's falling apart, but you, but you got, but you paid the, uh, the other side of the service row, one side, but from my house to Livingston, it hasn't been paid since I've been there. It doesn't make sense and it's falling apart. I was telling Scott today, I said, we're gonna, I'm gonna sink one day. I'm gonna be a sinkhole, you know? 
And I just want to live in my home, and I want to be safe, and I want to be happy. I'm a taxpayer. I work hard. I pass out our newsletters. I'm involved in my community. My neighbors know me. I'm always here to help. I love the kids. They know me. You know, I just want to be safe. And I don't want to go to Easton all the time. Fix Eastland Mall, you know? Yeah. Fix Eastland Mall. Thank, Bring thank back you. our stores if you can. And that's all I have. And thank you guys. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Tracy, um, for, for that. And you absolutely uh, deserve to be safe uh, in your home. Um, I know I saw all, uh, our directors. Did anyone want to comment or anything? I know I saw folks taking notes. No? Okay. All right, our final uh, speaker this evening is Ms. Judy Cobb with the Leewood Civic Association. Yeah. Welcome, Ms. Judy. You have three minutes. I think, who's here from Leewood Gardens? Scott and that young man over there. Beautification, beautification and safety. That's what I want to talk about. And children. Um, traffic should be monitored on Dundee Avenue because of children out during the Summer are playing ball in the streets, and those cars come off of Hamilton, and they're speeding <clears throat> like 35 or 40 miles an hour. And they, there's a, a curb, and there's a couple of accidents that have happened. I have talked about um, this problem at some of our um, association meetings because at one time I was the president. I think they hurt me. I thought they hurt me, but nothing has been done. We need uh, monitoring some between Shady Lane and Hamilton on Dundee because the cars are speeding around that bend and children are playing ball. And you know children run after balls. I'm surprised to this date that we haven't had any uh, fatalities for children so far. But we need uh, some type of monitoring. I don't know what would you suggest. Also, paved streets. I've been here in uh, Leewood Garden for almost 20 years, and I live on Healy Drive off of Shady Lane, and those streets have not, the, those streets have not been paved all the time that I have lived here. I have a nurse, I am a senior citizen, And I thought that was my time to stop. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, a senior citizen, and I, we take, my husband and I, we have pride in our neighborhood. And we want to keep it that way. So, Abs thank well, you well, for thank listening. And Thank you for the extra minute. <laughs> uh, anytime, Ms. Cobb, and thank you for uh, your advocacy. And uh, we wrote it down here, so looking at traffic calming, 
uh, on Dundee and, and street resurfacing. So thank you so much. Well, we have um, heard you and heard from a, a lot of folks today. So I want to first thank you all for coming out uh, and being here. Uh, and let me just say this, you know, uh, Columbus uh, is uh, a great city. We have our challenges. And I say this oftentimes to folks everywhere I go, is that as a growing city, uh, our growth is both our greatest opportunity, uh, but it's also our greatest pain point. Uh, and we are a city of 223 square miles, uh, and that's a lot. Uh, and so th there are things and, that we get to and some things that we don't, and eventually we will. Uh, but what I will say to you is that your continued advocacy does not fall on deaf ears uh, for me. It does not fall on deaf ears uh, for our uh, chair, uh, President Pro Tem Brown, or any of my council members, and in fact, any of the directors and administration sitting here. Um, so thank you for giving your input um, today. We may not be able to get to your specific problem tomorrow, uh, but do know that it is on our radar. Uh, it is our goal that every family, me every member uh, of our community, regardless of your neighborhood, feels safe, has a quality of life that everyone uh, is worthy of. And it is our goal to make sure that is uh, for every single resident. And not only simply the residents here today, but the next generation. So thank you all for taking uh, your time to provide your input uh, on this uh, critical and most important part uh, of the work that we do, which is our capital budget. Uh, just uh, some little final announcements. Our target uh, date for taking up the capital budget will be July 25th. That is our last council meeting uh, of, um, before recess break, uh, where we will take up the mayor's capital budget for uh, consideration and passage at city council. Uh, I want to thank again all of you uh, for being here, in particularly all of my commissioners. If you're a commissioner or a civic association leader, if you could just raise your hand, please, so we can recognize you. Thank you all for uh, your leadership. Uh, you don't do it for the pay. We know that you do it because you're passionate about uh, your community and the people in your community. I also want to thank, <laughs> I also want to thank uh, Mayor Ginther. Um, for his efforts in putting and submitting this uh, capital budget, as well as Auditor Kilgore, also to uh, Director of our Department of Finance, Director Owens, uh, and all of the department directors uh, and staff here today. Also want to thank uh, our friends uh, at CTV, as well as uh, all of our staff at Council, Mac er Matt Erickson, uh, the Director of our Legislative Research Office, uh, Council President Pro Tem staff, Ms. Kelsey, uh, and Tigges, uh, who are here, as well as my staff, J.P. Dorval, and then also want to thank our community uh, engagement team for council as well as for the administration. Again, thank you all uh, for being here, and that concludes tonight's uh, fourth and final public hearing on the capital budget. Have a great evening.